Hey, so uh, I want to talk about uh, the challenges in ocean data acquisition today. And um, I'm going to do that uh, on the example of CCS monitoring via base baseline seismicity. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, about me. Hi, I'm Lucas. And um, I create uh, embedded systems at KUM, which is a company that builds underwater data acquisition systems specifically mainly um, ocean bottom seismometers, but also other kinds of systems. And we have a big focus on reliability and ease of use. And what I want to talk about today is carbon capture and storage. So there are some, some sectors of the industry that are easily decarbonizable. For example, energy production, you just uh, have some solar panels and some wind turbines, and then basically your energy is decarbonized. But there are other industries where that is not so easy, like uh, steel production or cement production, for example. So those unavoidable carbon emissions, we would like to capture instead of release into the environment, and then store that. And uh, right now, we're uh, evaluating, um, or like, Several countries are evaluating the possibility to store the captured CO2 uh, beneath the ocean surface in geological formations. And um, CO2 storage can cause stresses in the geology of the, of the storage formation. So monitoring is essential, because otherwise uh, disasters could happen and we wouldn't know about them. Um, so the seismicity is measured with uh, seismometers, uh, which are distributed over the storage formation, uh, over the storage site, basically. And um, what we do is, uh, before the injection of CO2 begins, we do, um, we do a baseline seismicity measurement. So we measure all the sounds that the ocean floor usually makes. Um, including small earthquakes, and then we get a picture how everything looks in an undisturbed state. And then when the, when the CO2 injection begins, um, we continue measuring the seismicity, and uh, even after, after it ends. And when there are any changes, we can image those stresses that, that might appear um, in, a, in a 3D a uh, picture of the, of the ocean floor, and then take informed decisions on whether to continue the injection or do the injection somewhere else, or like um, do it faster or slower. And uh, risk can uh, properly manage uh, this way. But um, on land, all of this would be easy, but on the ocean floor, there are a lot of challenges. Um, first, the ocean is a very remote location. There's no cellular networks. There's no, um, uh, yeah, um, there's no communication possible, basically. The water absorbs all electromagnetic waves. Uh, so um, all you have uh, is acoustic data in the water. And um, the only connection to the outside world you have uh, is via satellite connections. And the maintenance is complicated and expensive, especially all the equipment has to be brought there by ship and maintained by ship and uh, collected by ship. And uh, ship time is extremely expensive. And then there's also limited energy supply. All the energy you need for your system has to be supplied by batteries, um, which increase the weight and the size of your system. So you need to really uh, focus on low energy consumption and basically make the best use of energy that you can. And then also the ocean is uh, a very harsh environment. Salt water is very corrosive, especially to steel, even stainless steel that corrodes away in a few months, basically. And um, there's also marine uh, flora and fauna, like algae or barnacles, 
muscles that attach to the instruments and uh, impact the functionality. So you need to uh, care for that. And uh, an example system that we have for the monitoring is the KUM spider system because it has those little spidery nodes that look a little bit like spider legs, which uh, tackles all of these challenges. And this is basically my job at the company, um, coming up with solutions to all those marine challenges. For example, the electronics uh, uses very little power, so um, we invest a lot of time and effort to bring down the power consumption as much as possible, and also to make trade-offs, uh, like things that we don't do because they would uh, use too much power. And then we have those multiple sensor nodes that uh, all get, uh, the, the, the data of which all get connected on the central node. And then there's also pre-processing because we can't send all the data to shore in near real time. That is only possible when we go there by ship and, and uh, retrieve the data. But we still want near real time data. So we need to pre-process the data to get only the most interesting bits uh, to basically send that over satellite connection. And for that, for, we have this uh, surface messenger, which is uh, connected via a winch to the, to the system. And then that travels to the surface, establishes a satellite connection, and sends the most interesting bits to the, to the shore. And uh, so the system operates for several years fully autonomously. You just go there, install it, and then you're done and it continuously delivers little bits of data. And then after some time, you get back to it, retrieve it, and then you get all the data. And that's one of the trade-offs you have to do uh, in ocean data acquisition. Yeah, that's about it. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, now I give the my, uh, stage to the next speaker. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. However, as much as I'm excited, it takes quite a bit of courage for me to talk in front of so many unfamiliar faces, because I'm not a born public speaker, but I'm a born geologist, and I love to collect inter and interpret um, geomarine data, data from the seafloor. Um, as a geologist and ambassador of our surveyors, of the company, Subsea Europe Services, I quite know the fascinating and challenging world beneath the seafloor. <clears throat> and I know that it's, and it's really difficult to, uh, to collect data from the geomarine, from marine from the seafloor. But why, and today I would just like to give you an insight of this task of collecting uh, marine data, which uh, depends on meticulous planning and high technical expertise and high collaboration. And what fascinates me so much about the ocean's floor, how much of the Earth are covered by the oceans? 70%, and how much of these 70% have been mapped so far? Barely 20%. So when it comes to our climate, we really need to know this seafloor, this terra incognita, when we want to act accordingly. Mm, what is the most important to get this data from the surface, from the seafloor? First of all, planning. When we want to get data from the seafloor, we really do need to plan. For example, what data does the client want? What, uh, how can we get this data? How can we get the data from the, from the floor? And to rely on all these challenges, or we will explain later more challenges. To overcome all these challenges, we rely on cutting-edge technology. 
What am I showing to you? These are two, uh, these are uh, on the one side an unmanned service vehicle and an hovering autonomous underwater vehicle. These are vehicles which can be equipped with hydroacoustic equipment, devices, and collect data for us autonomously. Ooh. On the one hand, we have the unmanned service vehicle, which is connected all times by radio to an operator and can be and is autonomous, can be retrofitted step by step with the help of software. Under the USB, we can connect, we can, it can be equipped, for example, with the multi-beam echo sounder, with a side scan sonar, with cameras. We have also the iCambulis, which is a hovering autonomous underwater vehicle. And it is possible to fully automate inspections of underwater structures like monopiles. It is, but for both, also the, the USB and the HAUV, they can be launched from a mothership. So you don't need to go in areas where it's difficult to go by boat. And as Lucas explained, as Mr. Jürgen explained before, ships are extremely expensive. But not only the vehicles help us to collect and interpret the data from the seafloor. Also, artificial intelligence is helping us. AI is increasingly used to analyze large data sets. We have here an example where we used neural networks to recognize boulders at the, at the seafloor. You would say, why do we need boulders? These are structures which are extremely in interesting and important for habitats. Or if you want to plan a, an offshore wind park, you do need to know what is below the surface. You need to know what is on the seafloor. As for now, I'd like you to tell me maybe, because we have dealt lots of like the sessions before. They were basically about land, right? But now we switch to the, to the blue economy data. And that's why, as an intro question, I would like to zoom out a little and ask you guys, what do you... Why do you think it is important that the GIS world is actually considering more and more to have more data about the, the, the blue part of our planet? Let's put it like this. Um. Why it's important to get more data, for yes, example, yes, from yes, the yes. On the one hand, um, we want to use the ocean more sustainably. And therefore, you cannot just close your eyes and use it, you do need to know what, we, what is below. And you, you do need to know if, for me as a geologist, it's quite interesting if I have sand, if I have boulders, and so on. And we want to delineate habitats, for example. We want to know where we have, where we have uh, areas where we want where we are able to build offshore wind parks, for example. We want to know where it's possible to put cables around. And it's not, and for example, it's not, the, it's not only offshore wind. It's, for example, seagrass. Seagrass is growing on the seafloor. And it's really important. It's a, it can capture a lot of carbon. And we want to know where can we find this seagrass we can delineate what is the sequence. Was the sequence before? How? What's happening when we change something? In, in when we change something in 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 our economy? Or, or what what will happen when we change? For example, when we build an offshore wind park, and does it change anything in the area in the seafloor, or does it change? The, uh, um, the ecology or the below on the seafloor, on the seabed. So at the end of the day, it makes more sense to understand the whole picture, so both land and water, in order to make more holistic decisions and better decisions that are that make sense in the middle and long run, not just in the short term. And therefore, I, I do understand that there is just some, inevitably, there is an interaction between land 
and water, especially when it comes to um, human-centered projects, not the ones that are just ecologically focused. Lucas, what would you like to say as this in, in this intro session where you can actually say why it's important to gather data about the blue part of our planet? Uh, well, if, if we want to do something like uh, the CO2 storage uh, that I talked about earlier, then uh, there are risks associated with it. Like, we can't just go there and pump in CO2 and hope for the best. We need to actually know what happens there. And uh, we can only know that if we have accurate data um, over all the formations, the geology, um, how, how the how the CO2 is moving, how cracks are forming, how stresses are forming. And um, that, that is really important. And that also uh, applies to basically every other field of, of science that you can do on the ocean floor. And overall, it's a very interesting environment, as Agatha said. 70% of the world's uh, surface is ocean. And uh, this is basically, for the most part, unexplored territory, or very barely explored. And um, having better data there will uh, basically enable lots of other research and our understanding of the planet as a whole. Wow, that sounds pretty fancy. But in, in the end, that's exactly what it is. And I do think that the monitoring aspect, especially when it comes to the long-term thinking, is quite important. So the, the earlier we start, the better it is for uh, everything we do with the water. Now, having stated why it is actually important to monitor, to gather data about the, the blue part of our planet, I'd like to deep dive a little more into, literally, actually, <laughs> into the question how we can actually master all the challenges that we are confronted with when we try acquiring or gathering data about the ocean because we have limited accessibility as you have actually pointed out in your in your slides um, we have the problem of like yeah let's let's say the the sheer like vastness or, or, or size of the, the the regions that need to be um, actually digitized there's quite a few challenges maybe you can few, like name a few more and then tell us how you're overcoming them this is for both, like, <laughs> whoever starts. <laughs> um, yeah, we overcome these challenges first with planning, with meticulous planning. Um, and then we are, as, as I uh, show you, we, we are using these USBs or the USB. It's, it's better to, you do, we are using USB and the help of AI. So you, you, Going out, you can you can you can um, you can measure permanently the data. You can measure permanently and get permanently data from the from the seafloor, and and we um, and we are working together with other companies and using sensors and try to to yeah we we. And we have to plan, we combine also uh, data that already are taken from the, from the ocean. We are, uh, we are working together with uh, authorities so that if there are data, uh, we combine them, we are filling the holes. And that is, that is actually, I think, something that is truly important to understand the governance perspective of the data acquisition or data collection. But first, I'd like really to focus on the, let's say, technical issues. Maybe okay. you can point them out a little, like, because I'm not a tech guy, I must admit, but you can maybe communicate what is exactly so difficult about the underwater data collection, and then how do you overcome these things? Uh, I think a lot of it is also uh, instrument design. Um, the, the ocean is a very unique environment in, uh, in the challenges uh, that, that, that it uh, poses. And uh, you can, you can um, get to these challenges by making compromises at the right uh, 
right, at, at the right spots and uh, doing your instrument design um, with that environment in mind. So for example, the seawater is highly corrosive. So some companies are using steel tubes, which work OK for short durations, but they are really, really susceptible co to corrosion. So what we do is we only use titanium for all our metal parts. And the titanium parts, after 20 years, they look like new. So that is not an issue anymore. Then there's the, the issue of the instrumentation itself. For example, when you have a seismometer that continuously records data on land, you usually have a data logger that digitizes the data, and then it has an Ethernet connection which constantly uploads the data to, uh, to a national seismic network or a scientific network so that you can access the data in real time. But that's not a concern at the ocean floor. Like when you do a seismology survey, you deploy the instruments, and then you go away for a whole year. And then after a year, you come back and hope the instrument has recorded. But obviously, the instrument doesn't need Ethernet for that. Actually, that would use way too much power. So the data logger we designed uh, actually makes a lot of compromises. And if you tried to use it on land, it would be a really bad experience because it, it lacks all the features that you expect from a scientific data logger for land stations. But it makes all the right compromises at the right, at the right spots that it's perfectly suitable for the, for the marine environment, for this autonomous data collection in campaigns instead of real time. That is quite interesting and actually shows evidence of the one of the, like, I think, most important principles when it comes to applying technology. Like, what is the actual purpose of the technology and how much of sophistication do we need to, to actually reach our goals when we apply a certain kind of technology? So in this case, for a maritime context, that's perfectly enough. And actually, I wanted to ask about the energy supply. How does this work? And is that also a, a challenge when it comes to the data acquisition in the, in the deep waters? You can <laughs> yeah, it, it is a challenge. Um, for example, for the USB, you, we have batteries which are working for around six hours. And then we have to change. But we have consequently can very fast change. And, uh, and the batteries are improving. So they are working longer. And with the HAV, there is an Ethernet connection and other so batteries which are working a, a little bit longer. But as you mentioned, it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And you have mentioned the Ethernet connection a few times. Um, what is, like, the electromagnetic waves, they don't work, right, underwater? It's, it's not possible. So that, just for That's me right. to clarify, this is why you are actually, um, like, uh, stepping back and using Ethernet, right? Uh, well, so underwater, you have a few options for communication. The first option is you lay a cable. But a cable is really expensive. Basically, when, when you lay a cable that's only a few kilometers, it already dwarfs the cost of the instrument. So usually when you, when you do a survey in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, then that's out of the question. Um, the other communication channel you have is acoustics. So basically what whales use, they talk to each other over hundreds of kilometers with, uh, with their whale songs. And uh, actually, hundreds of kilometers. Uh, yeah, the, the 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 acoustics underwater are really different uh, from in the air. So uh, you need a lot of lot more pressure to get uh, to get it going, but then it travels a very a very long distance. And um, if the conditions are right, uh, you can actually communicate over over hundreds of kilometers. But that's more of a niche case. So, but the problem with the acoustic channel is it's only a few kilohertz of bandwidth, and uh, that limits the data rate you can get. So our instruments mostly only use it uh, to uh, for, for for like uh, basic signaling. For example, when we have deployed an instrument and that sits there for a year or maybe even two, and then afterwards you come back, you give an acoustic signal, which is just 
a few beeps, and then the instrument on the ocean floor hears that, mm -hmm. opens the lever, and then drops an anchor weight, mm -hmm. and that makes it possible that the instrument comes back to the surface, mm -hmm. um, like on its own. Um, yeah, but uh, electromagnetic waves, for example, Wi-Fi or, I don't know, LTE or something, that has a range of a few centimeters under, underwater. Okay. You can do it if you have the instruments right next to each other, so they basically have to touch. But uh, as soon as you have only a few meters of distance, that, that completely stops working. You would like to add something? But um, in the USB, we are using 4G. If there is a payload inside, a payload PC, and we are using 4G and we get the information in real time, which is measured because we have the USB above the water. So, so there is use cases where you can, like niche use cases where it works and makes sense. Okay, actually. Yeah, if you have the antenna above the surface, above or like the on surface? the surface, yes, okay. exactly. then, the, then the, the electromagnetic wave travel through the air, and that's not a real problem. It's only when the system is submerged, then it becomes a problem. So um, what you often also have is uh, a buoy with the antenna, and that is connected to the system via a cable. Oh, I see, I see. For yep. example, um, I showed it earlier on my slide, the, the spider system actually has a winch, uh, which uh, has like a little messenger buoy that travels from the instrument to the surface, sets a, sends a little message to the, to the, to the shore, and then it, it submerges again. Mm -hmm. I actually, yeah, I, I can remember, I hope you do as well, quite well, the, the illustration that you've shown of the spider, and that makes perfectly sense, yeah. that the, the communication between the thing on the water is basically organized in a different way than after this to the to the station. Yeah, exactly. You need this 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 hop between this uh, between the the ocean floor and the surface, because only then you can use electromagnetic waves and, for example, satellite connections. So at the end of the day, it's it's a combination of both. Yeah. If there's something else that you'd like to add to this technical part, please do do so now. Otherwise, I'd like to continue. Is there something that we should? Discuss here? Okay, then I'd like to continue with the next question, which is going to be, so we have gathered all the data, or we are about, or we know how we can gather it, more or less, mm -hmm. with the instruments you've mentioned before, but could you please tell us what are the main use cases, if we had to cluster them, that data actually collection underwater is happening for? Like, who... Is, has an interest for that? Is it more the civil side? Is it more the military side? Is it more the, yeah, I think the research side could also be part of the civil, but can you maybe elaborate on who would be the customers of your company's services, for instance, and then kind of give us a, draw us a picture who, who's currently a pioneer when it comes to data acquisition in the blue economy? Um. Our clients are mainly the offshore wind park. Uh, okay. Yeah, the, the offshore wind parks where we have regularities in Germany. Where, for example, we have to uh, we have to maintenance the whole area of the wind park in four years. So every year we have to collect data from the seafloor. Uh, 25 of one for 25 percent of the area we have to measure again, and uh, to just to know if there are uh, if there are problems with the cables or anything else. Also, the monopiles have to be uh, maintained every year. Mm, also, um, yeah, these are the the main clients, but um, if we look in the future, we also want to know how, how uh, the seafloor chains, and we have, for example, a lot of unexploded ammunition. We have a lot of unexploded ammunition. We also do need to find this ammunition in the Baltic Sea and in the North Sea, which was thrown into the water after the World Wars. 
this will come or is increasingly in, uh, yeah. Thank you. Would you like to add something? Uh, yeah, so our main customers are, um, up until the recent years, uh, mainly universities for different uh, scientific research. Um, in the last few years, we have uh, also been expanding into the ammunitions clearance um, industry. So, as Agata said, uh, there are vast quantities of um, unexploded ammunitions uh, in the Baltic Sea, in the North Sea, that uh, lie there since the Second World War, and um, that begin to rot, and the explosives inside start leaking into the water and damaging the ecosystem. So we need to act now and uh, basically clean that, that up. Then there's also our uh, vibro coring business, uh, which uh, mainly is addressed to offshore wind energy providers or geology services that uh, want to take ocean floor samples. And then the next big thing is probably the carbon capture and storage monitoring under the ocean floor, which is something that's in development right now in multiple country, countries. There are multiple projects uh, all over Europe that want to store CO2 in ocean geological formations, and that needs to be monitored. And this is something that uh, we also do or want to do. That sounds very interesting, and on both sides, actually. And like keeping that in mind, my next question would be, because on land, we often have the situation that there are several stakeholders that are interested in how the land is basically digitized, let's put it very generally. But here, when it comes to the blue economy, there's not only several stakeholders, there's also several countries and different institutions like on a supranational level. And if you had to actually draw a map based on the use cases that you just mentioned and your primary customers, could you tell us how, it, how does it work? How does this ecosystem actually balance itself out? How does it, yeah, what are the rules? How do you share data? How, is, how are use cases developed together? Is it mainly through research projects or is there initiatives between the countries that they push those things forward? Is it the energy supplying companies that are the pioneers? <laughs> Well, in my experience, uh, the players that operate mostly on a multinational level are actually the, the universities oh. and the research teams, which often do cooperations um, that span several countries. For example, France and Germany are working closely together there and doing expeditions together. Mm -hmm. Then, obviously, there are other countries that are working together. On the carbon capture and storage side, it's mostly national projects where we are in multiple of them, but they obviously they coordinate to, to a level, but it's mostly like the, the Norwegians do their thing in Norwegian waters and Germany tries to do the storage in German waters. Um, and obviously there's a lot of regulatory uh, complications, um, even when you don't have the, the multinational level. For example, in Germany, it is not yet legal to uh, inject the CO2 into the, uh, into the ocean floor. That is only coming in the next few years, probably. So this is still at the beginning, at the exploration phase, basically. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of movement. And the, the scientific community has, has been doing that for, for decades, basically. They've always worked together and um, done projects together. And this is something really exciting. It is, but let me ask one question further. But this means at the end that the research funds that are being actually allocated for this research projects, they are part of a political decision or priority? Or is it something that the universities decide on themselves? So I wonder if this is something that has a geo or just political priority, and that's why the, res the universities are doing it, or if they are doing it just because they're interested in that and want to make the world a better place? 
uh, well, I'm not too deep into scientific uh, financing, but um, they are obviously the national bodies that uh, finance the, the national science. Um, but there's also the European Union, obviously, which, uh, which, which has budgets for different projects. And there's also steering happening. But the uni universities also have their fair share of input as they are the ones proposing the projects. Actually, yes, yes. As in every other field, that's, that's the, the task of the universities, actually, yeah. or the research institutions generally. OK, exactly. would you like to add something, Agatha, to that? Um, could, could you repeat? If, you want to know if, if who is forcing more this economy, if it's national or Exactly. So who, what are the driving forces, basically, in this ecosystem? Who are the stakeholders and how are they collaborating, especially on a multinational level? Um, yeah, as you mentioned, in an international way, mostly universities are working together. And... Um, but uh, forcing, I would say that it's more uh, or less the, uh, most the wind energy sector who is really forcing the, the, uh, um, the data acquisition, the, uh, we want to get the information and the authorities and also EU directives. Because we have EU directives um, for a couple of years where all uh, European countries have to um, have to delineate their most important habitats, and for this we do need to digitize the uh, ocean's floor to just to know which habitats do we have on the uh, on the seafloor. So also the regulatories from the uh, Europeans. That, so at the end of the day, that's also a political driving force, basically. So that makes perfectly sense. In that regard, I'd like to be interested in, I'd be interested in the challenges from this organizational point of view that you are currently seeing in front of us. Like, what would you like to have solved in the upcoming five to ten years when it comes to data collection in in the blue economy? Um. For example, regulatories also, I would like to have solved, uh, solved because in some countries it's uh, cr more clear how to use USVs. Um, so this would be quite important, especially when we have, because we have the lack of skilled people and we do need this data. This should be cleared. Also, um, how to, to store all this data. This should be also clear data management. Mm. So, and uh, more to how can we harmonize all this data also. There's quite a lot of different uh, data types and we do need to harmonize. It's also, there are, there are, we are trying to harmonize it, but it's not still yet ready. How do we harmonize all these data? How, where do we store all these data? And how can be the regulatories for USBs in future? Especially when we look, when we look in the lack of skilled people and uh, yeah, and, and areas where we cannot go by vessel. I think the the harmonization of data, also the the requirement or, yeah, the more skilled people basically in the field. This is something that is, seems to be a meta topic because it's also on land very important, also for <laughs> smart cities. Um, is there anything else you would like to add when it comes to the upcoming challenges that Agatha actually pointed out already? Uh, well, I'm mostly um, familiar with the seismological community and there's actually a lot happening um, where they try to build... Uh, shared databases where you can access the results of, of studies that have been done of, of experiments and um, all the data gets collected into um, a multinational data pool that is coming in the next years and it's, it's developing right now and they are already pretty far I would say um, in other fields there is little sharing right now um, 
which is like th th this would be a very important change that the data is shared between the institutions so you can actually make use of, of more of the data. Yeah. So you, you'd like to add something? I, I would like to, to add something to the data management. Uh, we were working on a project where we searched data from the CIPRO and we have had to call to different institutions and everybody has a little bit on his hard disk and you have had to search this together. So this is really quite important. Yeah, you yeah as, as you mentioned, like uh, also the storage of the data is quite a challenge since the, the data storage media get bigger and bigger. So you collect more and more data, but that has to be stored somewhere. And uh, that also gets more expensive the more data you, you have. And downloading, downloading the data takes quite a lot of time. Yeah. And um, you, ha you have to keep that in mind. That's, that's a challenge that has yeah. to be addressed, basically. And then we can also add, as you mentioned, we, we collect more data. And then, for example, we do need something who is also helping to, to interpret the data, as we mentioned, for example, artificial intelligence, so that we do need not only to collect, also interpret, also um, analyze the data. To create information in, out of it. <laughs> yeah, to create actually, the information. Information out of the data. Exactly, yeah. And I think that brings us to the last topic, I would say, last session oh, of this session. I'd be interested in the outlook, so when we look basically into the future and also maybe have a, maybe an ironic view on the topic, maybe you have some anecdotes to share or maybe there's something that you could share about your fascination when it comes to geospatial data in the blue economy. Is there something that's like more of a, an open, open question or also maybe some new technology that you're looking forward to applying like some fancy autonomous systems? Is there something that crosses your mind that you'd like to share with the audience? With, um, yeah, uh, uh, what me fascinates on the data is, is when, you, when you see them and when you interpret them and when you, for example, com uh, combine different information, not only from a multi-beam echo sound or not only from a side scan, also videos, and you connect them and you see that this does fit together and when you and when you add them to other information like currents and you see okay everything does fit together and when you are not exactly with the vessel out just sit in front of your computer and see that something is that the USB is measuring for you, and you, you get the data instantly in the same in real time. That fascinates me. I can imagine. <laughs> I would love to have some more visual insights on that process where you can actually see in real time how data is being, or the environment is being digitized and processed. Um, but oh, when you when you sometimes have only one device or um, different devices and you don't know, um, you, you cannot interpret the one device but put together the information from another device and then it does fit and you learn what could be the other, let us say, an object detection or in the detection of, of seagrass of other environments. And so this does fit together, you learn all the time. So it's this really about exploring new frontiers and exploration in generally that fascinates you. Very nice, very um, impressive motivation. What, do you, what would you like to share? Yeah, because th th that is actually something I want to follow up on, the exploration aspect. The, the sea is very much, well, we, we can't say unexplored, but uh, th there's still a lot to explore. It's actually a huge adventure. and. Um, if you've ever been on a research vessel, it's quite an experience, and I can only recommend that to, to anyone uh, in the audience if uh, that is something you're interested in. So, um, yeah, it always feels like, like exploration, and uh, there's always something, something new to, to discover.
I strongly believe that. Uh, so far, I only read books or watched movies on that kind of, of things. But if, if there would be an opportunity, I think no one would say no to, to join a, a research vessel, right? <laughs> um, I would like to actually surely, like slowly but surely close our, our panel, our session. But I think what makes sense is to make you share maybe one request, one information that you'd like to share with our audience that you would like to stand for at, or that you would like to create a touch point for, like maybe some specific topic, some use case, some technology where that is, that is important to you or some thought that you would like to end the session with. Is there something? Uh, Why I should people approach you, <laughs> for instance? <laughs> I don't know, for me as a systems designer, it's uh, always exciting to create uh, systems that are actually useful with the user in mind, um, with the use case in mind, and uh, then optimizing them to a point where they work pretty much perfectly. And um, yeah, basically fulfill all the requirements. Um, and also, if possible, they should look slick and uh, bring the user joy when interacting with the system and deploying it, retrieving it, analyzing the data. So it should never be in the way of the user, but, but, but be a helpful assistant, a helpful tool. Nice. So if, if there's anyone who, who's interested in that kind of call to action, please feel free to, to contact or to approach Lucas yeah. uh, after the panel. How about you, Agatha? Yeah, for, for me, it's... For me it's important to to give to give the information so that people can make decisions on how they will use the floor this is really important for example when when we interpret this I can say oh here's a hard ground or here's a very muddy it's it's really important to give the information and and to give the information about changes how was the environment a couple of years ago? How is the environment now? What's changed? This is really important for us. And how can you collect all these data and interpret and analyze and use this, what you analyze, this information? So for anyone who is interested into creating big action from big data, I would say in that case, <laughs> please approach Agatha. Thank you very much for this enlightening discussion. And um, if there's no questions from our audience, unless please raise your hand to our both experts, I would actually like to close this panel now. Thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.